I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. When I recorded my first ever program here in 2014, the subject with digital scholar and educator John Palfrey was the very real possibility of a digital Pearl Harbor, or 9-11, in our lifetimes. It's clear from our evaluations on The Open Mind that such a crisis played out during the 2016 campaign, but not as we expected. We lack the imagination, foresight, and most of all, political will to respond as governments, citizens, and corporations, which often were hosts of malignant disinformation and enablers of massive security breaches. Joining me today is Christopher Painter, Commissioner of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. For over two decades, Painter has been at the helm of American internet policy as a prosecutor of high-profile cyber crimes and then as a senior official at the Department of Justice, FBI, National Security Council, and finally the State Department. In his most recent role as the nation's top cyber diplomat, Painter coordinated and led the diplomatic efforts to advance an open internet and information infrastructure, establishing the Office of the Coordinator for Cyber Issues dedicated to advancing the diplomatic aspects of cyber issues ranging from national security to human rights. Welcome, Chris. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you for being here. You were pivotal in brokering an accord, or at least theoretically an accord, between the U.S. and China in 2014. What were you and your colleagues attempting to accomplish, and has it been enduring? So we were faced with a situation where there was widespread theft of commercial information, trade secrets, other business proprietary information by China, uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And this was becoming not just a cyber issue, but really a core economic issue and national security issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was strong feeling that this really had to stop. This was stealing the life's blood of our economy going forward. Uh, so what we were trying to get is that to stop, frankly. And, and we were looking at different aspects to do that. And one of the aspects was trying to uh, get China to agree that this was something that should be prohibited and not done. Now, I will say there is a difference between theft of intellectual property to benefit your own commercial sector and espionage. Every country gathers information. Every country will for all the time they have from the beginning. You can't really prohibit that. But this is a specialized kind that we don't do and we don't think any country should do. So uh, Cambridge that, Analytica was really at the intersection of the for-profit commerce and espionage. Yeah, right? it was a little different, though. I mean, there were for, it was for-profit uh, espionage, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, which is not necessarily all that new, although the way that was done was, I think, a new, a new uh, form of this. But the, the kind of theft of information that then you use, uh, so let's say you steal the plans to something or the trade secret for something, and then you give it to your own commercial sector, and then they become competitive, uh, and they use that to become competitive and really displace your own uh, industry. So that's, that's what we're trying to stop. And it did you know, it was interesting. It took really, uh, from the president on down, strong messaging to China that this was unacceptable, that this was just not a cyber thing. It affected the overall relationship. And we eventually got an agreement with them. And you asked if it's been enduring. I think after that agreement was reached, which didn't prohibit all hacking, because that's not realistic, but prohibited this kind of hacking, uh, a lot of people saw that, let that activity drop dramatically after that. And it did for a while. Now, it, right, recently, it's gone back up again, and that's a, a big concern, but I think partly that's due to the fact that the reason China wanted to reach this agreement, it was an irritant in the overall relationship. It was something that China cares about the way it's perceived. It was a big problem, not just in the cyber realm, but across the board with the U.S. It was a problem with Russia, or with, uh, I'm sorry, with Germany, with Japan, with uh, Australia and other countries around the world, and the U.K., uh, and so they agreed to do it. But now that the relationship is really frayed, I think they don't see any real need or benefit to, to comply with that, and that's the problem we have now. Are you referring to the implementation of the tariffs? I, I think if you, the overall relationship between the U.S. and China, I think it's fair to say, is not very good right now. Uh, right. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, there's certainly the, the trade uh, conflict, war, whatever you call it, going on, which I think is a, is a concern for them. And I think their, their feeling probably is, and I'm not in the Chinese mind, but I think that uh, what they're thinking is, why do we need to comply with all these agreements we made uh, if the relationship is so bad already? We're not improving the relationship, uh, and maybe it's even a bargaining chip. Who knows? 
The current president speaks lovingly of China at, at, <laughs> at times, at least the premier, the president, and yet has taken actions that obviously have injured that relationship. So that souring effect has materialized in the way that the United States and Canada are negotiating a potential resolution with someone in their technology sector who's accused of breaking the Iran yeah. sanctions. Look, the person who's been accused of Canada is accused of violating uh, the sanctions, of, of taking actions that violates them. It's against the law. There's no, you know, I see no issue uh, when you see violations of the law as a former prosecutor going after them. Uh, the, I think the larger question is, you know, how can you address all these issues? How can you make sure this doesn't happen? And look, the trade imbalance with China is a big issue, and, and we do have to address it. Uh, how we address it and how we message it, I th think, is important. You, you raise a really interesting point, though, when, uh, when you say that uh, Trump speaks lovingly sometimes of, of uh, President Xi. Uh, that messaging is, is kind of a problem. If, you're, if your messaging doesn't match your actions, it undercuts your own uh, negotiating, it undercuts your own deterrent value. I think the classic example, certainly with Russia, where, where despite all the evidence, despite all the things that even this administration has done, uh, Trump constantly calls into question whether Russia is responsible. It doesn't matter what you do in terms of sanctions or other things if your top leader uh, is not consistent in messaging. And Obama was very consistent in messaging with China for almost two years. Even if he decided not to prosecute forcefully enough the case against cyber espionage from Russia during the 16 campaign, behind the scenes and in public, he was consistently critical of WikiLeaks, Assange, and those criminals. There was a digital when you Watergate. Say he, you mean Obama? Obama, right? The, there was a digital Watergate, and the plumbers and dir dirty tricksters were were Russians. As a country, and I think this is testified to in ongoing support for the special counsel's investigation. This country has not seen accountability in the area where you prosecuted yeah. cyber criminals. When is there going to be accountability? Well, that's, that's a great question. I think you have to divide this into two, uh, two spheres. One is uh, nation states, and the other is individuals and criminals. Individuals and criminals we need to go after using our criminal tools. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to reach them for various reasons, but we need to continue to do that, and that, that's one aspect. When you're talking about nation states, we have been just terrible at deterring or punishing nation states for uh, activity that really violates all the norms. It goes beyond uh, you know, the kind of things we, we believe are acceptable conduct. So yeah, a good example certainly is in Russia. Um, when you're trying to deter someone, there are two aspects. One is uh, timely, and the other is something that actually makes a difference that's going to change their calculus in the future uh, and punish them for past conduct. Now, the Obama administration did come up with a series of package of expulsions and sanctions at the end of the administration. That was pretty late. I mean, frankly, I think it was clear we needed to act sooner, we needed to act more strongly. Uh, I don't think that those things really punished Putin or changed his calculus, because certainly he's engaged in this again and again after that. Uh, and then in this administration, there's been sanctions, there's been some other targeted events. Russia has not limited their malicious cyber activity to election interference. They released this big, what's called computer worm, the NotPetya worm, that was uh, several countries attributed to them. Yes, the U.S. and Australia and others have attributed these con this conduct to Russia, but you're not going to name and shame Russia. You know, you're not going to name, name and shame. You might China, but Russia or North Korea, that's not going to have an impact. It's a, it's a good foundation, but then you have to follow it up with action that actually will make difference to them. And then, as I said before, you have to couple it with consistent and strong messaging. You can't say, well, I don't know if they really did it. Uh, it's okay. He right. said he didn't do it. I mean, those, that, those undercut all the actions you're trying to do to actually punish that conduct and make sure there's accountability. And I absolutely agree with you. We have to be far better at imposing those costs. The kind of reciprocal action that could be meaningful is allowing the young people of Russia to have digital freedom and use the grassroots technologies that infuse our politics here mm -hmm. through the web to uh, bring about reform.
We have always been seen as the leaders in terms of freedom and democracy, and my colleagues at the State Department, and we work closely with them, champion this idea of internet freedom, uh, freedom online, and, and helping those communities who are, who are often oppressed or monitored try to escape that monitoring to express their, their uh, views. And, and uh, you know, there's something called Freedom House, which uh, measures the level of freedom in the world online every year, and they've seen that level of freedom decline year to year, which is a real concern uh, around the world. And, and if the U.S. is not championing those causes, if the U.S. is saying for political or whatever expediency, you know, human rights are important, but they're not so important that we're going to take them seriously and factor them into our larger policy, that, is, that gives carte blanche to these, uh, these countries, these dictators, these more, uh, these more repressive regimes around the world. And it's a good parallel to cyber because uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't have consequences for your actions, then you're creating a norm of it's okay, we can just do this. And the same is true in this area. And you can't look at cybersecurity totally separate than human rights or economic policy. They have to be looked at together. Where are you hopeful based on your own prosecutions in the United States? There is not really a criminal court or tribunal yeah. to adjudicate this. And, and that doesn't even work when there's genocide yes. uh, to the best of yeah. its ability. So what is the best hope based on your own prosecutions? You started doing this yeah. when cyber was just being born in That's the right. 90s. Yeah, right. um, how Back when it wasn't cool. <laughs> so so it, how, how is it working here um, in, in America yeah. in terms of the ongoing pursuit of justice uh, with domestic actors who hack us or attack our infrastructure? I, I think we've gotten better. I don't think we're there yet. I think I've seen, there are a couple of trends I've seen over the 20 some five years I've been doing this. One is that we have been get it, getting better, not just catching the criminals here, but also overseas. And, and it's trivial for a cyber criminal to route their communications through several different countries to evade detection. So in an unprecedented way, you have to have real international cooperation. We've gotten better at that. Uh, you know, it's still not perfect. I think a lot of criminals still see this as a cost-free or risk-free enterprise, but we've done a lot of big cases where we've wrapped up a lot of criminals around the world, and that sends an important deterrent message. So that's good. We've trained more people around the world. More countries have cybersecurity laws. They didn't used to have them. Back, I don't even remember, years ago when the I Love You worm came out, it was traced back to someone in the Philippines. The Philippines didn't have a law that punished that. So. That's changed, and that's changed around the world. So I'm hopeful about that. I'm hopeful about the, the kind of cooperation I'm seeing. It's a steep hill to climb still, which, which is an issue. I'm also hopeful that you know, we have done these joint attributions. So one of the things that uh, may be surprising is the Trump administration came out with its strategy, its cyber strategy recently. We did these in the Obama administration as well. The Trump cyber strategy is really very much like the Obama cyber strategy. It's not really very different. And that's actually a good thing. You're building on what you've done before. You're looking at this in a more uh, holistic way and saying we, we really don't have to create a whole new regime. We need to do this. And there was a portion of that that talked about deterring bad actors, including state actors. And it talked about, and it had a language in there and said, we are better acting together than, with other countries than we are acting alone. That doesn't sound very America first-ish, does it? It sounds actually very collaborative, and that gives me hope too. So, you know, I think that those things are continuing to go on, which is good. You know, there's lots of things that I'm, I'm worried about as well, but I think that there's some positive aspects. And, and the other thing I'd say is people care about this more. I mean, back when I was doing some of the early prosecutions, people thought, well, that's really cool, that's a neat thing, or, you know, it's a Robin Hood sort of thing. These hackers are cool, where now they really care about it. And, and you know, I think we're at the stage where, you know, Back when I used to go and talk to, if you went to talk to the Attorney General, if you went to talk to, although Janet Reno was the exception, she cared about this deeply. If you went to talk to a cabinet official in our system or a minister in, in, in uh, Europe, uh, you went to talk to a CEO about this, uh, and their eyes would roll back in the back of their heads and they would like run from the room. They didn't want to deal with these issues. They were technical issues. You technical people deal with them. And now there's a recognition this is a core issue of our you know, economic policy, our national security policy, our human rights policy, and our foreign policy. That's a big deal because it takes it out of that technical realm. Technical aspects are still important, but it really makes it a core policy issue. Now, the problem is people recognize it's an issue. They just don't know what to do about it. Right. They recognize it, and it's heartening to hear the copying and pasting of the Obama manual if, in fact, it's being implemented, which you yeah. can shed which light is, on. Which is a key question. Yeah. Right. 
But in, at the same time, this lack of concern was revealed um, when these folks' emails were hacked. Um, and that was an impetus, um, whether it was State Department officials or yeah. business executives. They became aware and concerned about it after their materials became, sure, uh, in effect, declassified, stolen, hacked, publicized, yep. which is, and it's, and it's, there's a learning curve. So yep. now they're up to speed potentially. But what about? Not sure they're up to speed, but they're, they're or in the it. process of. Yeah. A, and, and look, it makes a difference when, like, the executive that headed Sony Pictures lost right. their job because of the hacking sure, incident. Sure, sure. So here's my question to you as a fellow viewer of Mr. Robot. <laughs> When does this reach the point of a 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, and I'm thinking economic insecurity as a function of a hacking that is so basic to the necessity of our livelihood as Americans or as global citizens, um, you know, of course there are vulnerabilities yeah. that are particular to Bitcoin and new currencies, but uh, what about that scenario of a hacking that completely disrupts the economy. Well, we, we've talked about this uh, literally for 20 years. We've been worrying about the kind of uh, cyber attack that would be against critical infrastructure, the financial system, the electrical power system, um, the, you know, food distribution, something that would have catastrophic and, and really uh, uh, rolling consequences that, you know, blackouts, things like that. And there's no shortage of movies about this too, right? right? So I, you know, my, I tried to make my office unique in the State Department. I had movie posters uh, where, where <laughs> hackers or computers were the main characters. So I had like 30 of them uh, up there. And they're all dystopian movies. There are very few really happy movies there. That said, we haven't seen that kind of crippling cyber attack. We've seen cyber being used in, in war, uh, like in Georgia by Russia. We've seen some of the activity, obviously, with our election and others. We've seen certainly very serious activity. But that kind of crippling 9-11 or Pearl Harbor or something like that, I also, I'm not that fond of those terms. And the reason I'm not fond of them is if we keep waiting for that before we do something, we're never going to do anything. You know? So we need, to, we need to think about what's happening every day. And the, the conduct is pretty serious. I mean, Chris, is that election. because only state actors would have the bandwidth to do that and the rogue elements like an ISIS yeah. in a cyber unit of an ISIS or a like terrorist organization just doesn't have the equipment to perform it. I, th I think there's a couple aspects. One, yes, sophisticated actors in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran are always rated as the most sophisticated state actors uh, have more capability. But even there, if you talk about taking down like the electrical power grid, not just taking it down, but keeping it down. So that requires a lot. That's not just right. a instantaneous conduct. And yes, you know, this is an asymmetric area where people without much uh, uh, resources can cause kind of large disruptions, but can they really keep that disruption going in a way that's going to you know, right. substantially affect the economy? So, so I think that that's, that's a part of the issue. And, uh, you know, on, in terms of terrorists, we have been thinking about terrorists, and literally I, I remember giving a speech about this maybe 17 years ago, where we were worried about terrorists turning to this and attacking critical infrastructure. I think there's two reasons they have it. One, they're not really interested in doing that. They're interested in using the internet to communicate, to plan, to proselytize, to raise money, all those things. And they do that a lot. We've certainly seen ISIS do that a lot. But they're not interested in really attacking critical infrastructure when what they want to do is they want to attack physical targets and cause death and destruction that's going to have more of an impact. Now, maybe in the future they could do that in a way that's going to have a large level of impact. Maybe you're going to couple a physical attack with an attack on, say, emergency communications that's going to magnify it. Uh, we just haven't seen it yet. Now, we're always worried about it, but it's, I think, interesting that we haven't seen that so far. Well, the net effect of closing the power grid, oh, yeah. turning off the lights, sure. um, especially when it comes to the market yeah. and being able to produce necessities uh, of life and, and companies yeah. handicapping their ability to provide goods and services that are central to Oh. our health and well-being, that, that could be pretty serious. It, it could be. They could always borrow capabilities. They could rent capabilities. They could get other people to come in and bring capabilities. Uh, you know, I think we haven't seen this from nation states, by and large, because there's lots well, of reasons it doesn't make sense for them. I mean, right. yes, Iran and North Korea have been more active because they don't have much to lose, or especially North Korea does. Russia used to be much more stealthy, but now it's much more active, as we've seen, because, again, right. its position after the Ukraine invasion of the world community is very different. Um, 
so there's reasons that the nation states don't want to do it or they worry about escalation and reprisal. Uh, terrorists, uh, you know, there is still a chance, but th it's again having that widespread effect that they want to have and that long-term effect. It's m perhaps more likely to come from the yellow vest type movement. You don't, you don't want to also shoot yourself in the foot. You don't want to take down uh, infrastructure that's going to have an effect on your own life too. So. No, I'm not so, condoning it uh, whatsoever. I'm just saying that it seems that the dystopian of some of the fictional yeah, yeah. accounts are not so far um, in our in our future. I mean, there. I think that a lot of the grassroots protests that have grown up and are now marching in the streets or causing havoc are a function of economic true, discord. True. True. And we look. We've had hacktivists though for quite some time, and they haven't targeted these kinds of systems. And again, I think it's harder. And we're getting, we are getting better at protecting these systems. We're getting a better at, at protecting electrical power grids. We're getting better at protecting yeah. financial systems. It's not perfect yet. Uh, and there are you know, scary times. Like, for instance, when Russia sh you know, shut down part of the power grid in Ukraine, then we saw some what we call pre-positioning of malware on some of our power grid systems that looked like it was from Russia as well. Look, there's real concern about that. But, you know, I think we also have to look realistically at what, you know, what we're doing to protect ourselves, which we absolutely have to do. We have to do a far better job, and we are, I think, in protecting those systems and have resilience. So if something happens, we can bounce back from it so you're not down for a long period of time. Uh, and it's still not easy. Uh, it's not easy to have that sustained effect. What about the idea of a generator, in effect, having a generator to turn that on in the event of one of, one of these... Um, incapacitating uh, cyber, national cyber terrorist acts. Having a generator that's a like kind a, of a, a kind of backup yeah, plan. I mean, this what kind a, of that's absolutely, that's a resilience aspect. So, yeah. you know, you have to assume that sophisticated uh, actors, particularly state actors, if they really put their mind to it, can get into a system and can affect systems. Now, what that means is you do everything you can to protect your system. That's, you know, that's the cybersecurity part of it. Uh, you make sure there are consequences for people who break in. That's the deterrence part of it. So they don't do it in the first place. They don't see a benefit in doing it. And then the last part is you have to have resiliency. You have to have backups so that even if they succeed in doing this, you can get back up and running very quickly. There was a, a case a few years ago about Saudi Aramco where uh, hackers got into their system and basically destroyed all their computers, wiped all the data from all their computers. And interestingly, they didn't have that backed up. Mm -hmm. Now I think people realize you have to have that all backed up. You have to make sure that you have uh, those things uh, so that you can reconstitute yourself. One of the big worries I have that we haven't seen yet uh, is dealing with the integrity of information. So yes, we see all these attacks. We see the theft of information. Um, but the integrity of information means that if I, for instance, was able to hack into your uh, medical records and change your blood type, uh, so the next time you got a transfusion, you died. That's pretty significant. Or if I could somehow get into the stock exchange and, and make it unreliable in terms of the settling trades, that would have a widespread effect. We haven't seen that yet. Is your commission working with these sectors? What our commission is doing is we're looking, so there's various aspects of this issue, right? And part of the aspect is what are the long-term rules of the road? What is the, what is the framework we want that you know, states will agree to over time. So there's been work between governments on this. International law applies, which is important. It's not a free fire zone. But what are the rules of the road? What are the voluntary, at least in the beginning, rules of the road? Things like don't attack critical infrastructure absent wartime. Wartime, there's different rules, but don't do it in peacetime. Don't attack the certs, you know, you know, the computer emergency response teams. It's like going after the ambulances. The commission has come up with things like don't attack the public core of the internet, uh, because if we do that, you could take down the internet for everyone. Don't. Uh, you know, that industry has an obligation to look at their software to make sure the vulnerabilities are not there to the extent they can, that uh, states should have vulnerability equities processes, that uh, election machinery should be off limits too, that the states should not attack that. Does that mean that everyone will abide by those norms or embrace them? No. But what it means is that if they don't do that, then you have to have that level of accountability. And, and we don't have that firm understanding. There's a lot of uncertainty in cyberspace. You don't know what the rules are, you don't know what the consequences are, and we have to change that. Right, and in the seconds we have left, you're really attempting to resurrect a Geneva Accords or something like that for 
not so cyber, much not, cyber so, not so much a treaty because the Geneva Convention applies to cyber. I mean, I think the worry is when you say we need a Geneva Convention for cyber. The Geneva Convention applies to cyber. Things like proportionality, just all these things that have brought us safely into the 20th and 21st century, those are things that apply to cyber. We have to figure out how they apply, but they apply. But do we need a new body that is going to... I don't think we need a new body. I think what we need to do is get countries to accept these rules of the road, and then we need to start enforcing them. I think if you create a new body, that's a lot of overhead, right. and you don't necessarily get the payoff you're looking for. Chris, a pleasure to be with you today. Thank Happy you. Happy to be here. Thanks. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.